In talking about safety, it brings a nice allegory or introduction to this idea of reducing general anesthesia. And when we think about this, I start off with a fable, and my apologies to Shakespeare, but I came up with a little rhyme or a poem, um, and essentially it just talks about Aesop's fable of the grasshopper who prepared, or did not prepare, and the ant who prepared for different things, and as a result, was able to take good fortune to Hawaii. And with that, um, you know, a nice, lovely winter experience, which we oftentimes don't have in Boston. But when we think about this topic and whether or not we can reduce the general anesthesia that's done in our own labor and delivery units, we ask ourselves, is this an appropriate goal? Is it something that's not even possible between myself and my colleagues and my obstetric providers on our floor? And if it is possible, what are some tips that can get us moving in that direction? Well, appropriateness, I think, is defined by the patients that we serve. And certainly when we think about patients, and this was a woman we had just three months ago in our service, um, so the litany of different disease processes that pregnancy can sometimes bring. And did I mention she also had her jaws wired shut? She was involved in a motor vehicle accident uh, six weeks prior to her presenting to the labor floor. She had a Lafort one fracture, had her teeth wired shut together. A uh, pair of pliers at the bedside, just in case we needed to undo that. But it's pretty amazing that we sometimes think about the airway, we sometimes discard that thought, and obstetricians certainly discard that thought because they say, well, if they can't do a general, they can just do a quick spinal or a, a regional approach. When we think about that, we need to be prepared for that activity. And, and we recognize, and just as by way of review, and um, Rachel will be talking about this later on, we know that the airway changes over the course of pregnancy, and it certainly changes more when you have the introduction of the labor process. Just pushing and fluids res resulted in this change in this particular woman after just seven hours of labor and 45 minutes of pushing. So what you see at the beginning might not be what you see at the end. We recognize that these changes involve many different areas from the incisors to the oropharyngeal junction, but also all the way down to the glottis. More recent studies indicate that after the glottis, there's no further changes, but certainly everything that we're dealing with is something of, um, that's responsive to all the changes in pregnancy as well as what might happen in labor. That includes a desaturation and you get high BMI individuals BMI individuals in labor, which further reduces functional residual capacity, making our ability to control the airway, we have a time clock associated with that. This has underscored the idea that general anesthesia, when you compare it to regional anesthesia, the regional approach is safer. And that's in part why we bandy about, we encourage it, we talk to our parturients, we talk to our obstetric providers in trying to encourage the way that we do this in part because when we look at both maternal and fetal outcomes, and here's just a glance at some both emergent and elective procedures that we provide, um, we understand that general anesthesia can have implications for the fetus as well. And finally, the unknown factors that uh, the newest results or literature is going over, and gosh, this is moving very quickly. But um, we also need to think about what are the long-term impacts in the fetus. And, when we think about and we reflect on the maternal and fetal issues, we arrive to the idea that we do want to reduce general anesthesia for cesarean delivery. Now, is this possible? The two things that oftentimes stand in our way are certainly the comorbidities that the patients bring with them, but also the time we have to adapt to the provision of anesthesia. And when we look at any labor and delivery floor, and we interview anesthesia providers, oftentimes they'll say that these contraindications allowed them or mandated that they do a general anesthetic. In fact, when we took a look at our own service, roughly 75% of the time, we were saying that it was these comorbidities or the time pressure that enabled this process of general anesthesia. But we can change the incidence of general anesthesia. And um, we have to consider what is going on in terms of time. And when we look at this amount of time, we recognize that from decision to incision, we, and this is from the American College, but also the Royal College, the Israelis, Canadians, Australians, they all accept that from decision to incision should be 30 minutes. But the Germans, uh, with their 
precise efficiency, say, no, you don't have 30 minutes, you have 20 minutes. And if you're an institution that provides high-risk services, uh, ACOG says, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists say that you have just 15 minutes. But we don't actually have that whole 15 minutes because incorporated into that is the decision to contact of the anesthesia provider. And certainly that maps out some period of time. And then finally, the actual provision of anesthesia before you can mandate that incision. So there are some time pressures on us, and certainly in those situations where you have a patient that has a uterine prolapse or an abruption that is significant, we have a very slight measure of time in order to deal with this. So recognizing that we have this short amount of time, what are some of the tips that we can utilize on our labor and delivery floor to shape a direction towards neuraxial techniques? And I have 10 of them for us to consider. And there are things that work for us in part because we have looked at what is happening in terms of cesarean deliveries. We recognize that the incidence of cesarean deliveries is going up in the United States, Canada, and globally. But overall, the incidence of general anesthesia is coming down. And if we focus on our institution in particular, we also recognize that general anesthesia or cesarean delivery was going to go up dramatically. But we have, despite that, been able to reduce our incidence of general anesthesia to the lowest internationally reported rate. For the last 10 years, it's been under 0.6%. It, it ping-pongs between 0.3% and 0.6%, so less than 1% use of general anesthesia. How have we arrived at those numbers? Well, we made a very conscious effort. I came in 95, we made a very conscious effort to try and reduce our general anesthesia use, and the 10 ways that we adopted this, gosh, I'm sorry, this is moving, the clicker's moving faster than I am, um, is first of all, developing a core team. Um, now, this might not be possible in your groups. I recognize that. Some of us have very small groups. Some of us have private practitioners that come in and out. Some of us do not have control over who is in the group uh, that provides general anesthesia or provides obstetric anesthesia. But when you devise a group, you start having shared mental models. You start talking about management styles. And all of you can come to some agreement about some common goals. And this definitely has been demonstrated to reduce the incidence of general anesthesia. Secondarily, we incorporated a high-risk console system. Now, how do we do this? I'll share with that in a little bit. But the values of it is you get to identify significant disease very early on. You recognize those patients. You can incorporate different ways of dealing with them, including setting some expectations, expectations about maybe putting in an epidural a little bit earlier than they might have anticipated or wanted, but that you have a path and plan um, it, that's going to work well for them. This also generates money. Um, we bill for those referrals. Um, and so this might be an income stream for your, for your practice as well. And it also creates you as a stakeholder in pushing the boundaries of anesthesia care into more of the preoperative preparation and optimization, but also the postoperative signs as well. And then overall, it reduces maternal mortality. Now, Alison MacArthur, in looking at her own experience in Canada, establishing a high-risk console service, um, indicated that she sees roughly 7% of their deliveries but this only represents about 25% of individuals that she wishes she could see. Indeed, our own experience uh, demonstrates that we probably see about 70 to 80% of the people that we want to see. There's still some individuals that we uh, are not contacted, maybe because they uh, are new to the service or dropped in or, or something, or maybe their obstetrician didn't consider their comorbidity something that we should be concerned about. But our breakdown follows this roughly, that 20% of our patient population that we see in high risk has a cardiac entity, about 14% um, have a hematologic entity. But overall, Allison's group, as well as ours and the group out at Stanford, have demonstrated that you have increased referrals over time as obstetric colleagues find value in what you're providing. And in looking at this how-to guide of how to establish a clinic, it doesn't have to be a physical clinic. What we do is we set aside um, any, a period of time from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. and we say we'll see any patient that comes through your clinic. 
Um, and we just see them in the triage area. In the triage area, we go over our concerns, we um, fill out a consult note that we send back to the obstetrician as well as to the billing service. And then if we didn't see a patient who was in labor that was concerning to us, then we circle back around to the obstetrician and say, this would have been a lovely patient for us to have seen earlier. And in terms of what we've been able to do with our service and how well it's worked, is we see roughly two patients a week. Um, and in 30% of those patients, we have indicated a management change. There's something about what we recorded, the information we collected, that was able to change something, and we're, we were happy about that change. And much of that change has also translated, I believe, to better care in the parturient, and certainly a reduction in general anesthesia. Tip number three is the mandate the ability to see all parturients. There are some individuals on your labor floor that maybe they're cared for by a midwife. Midwives do have very strong beliefs sometimes about birth plans and respecting birth plans, and we do too. Uh, we recognize that those birth plans are something that people pay a lot of attention to, pour a lot of energy into, and um, some are multiple pages. Um, the longest one we've seen so far has been 35 pages. Uh, it said that you cannot mention the word epidural. So you can imagine my uh, preoperative assessment of that woman when we came into her room. It was like, we put something near your back that's supposed to help you through the labor process. Um, it was an artful consideration of what we do and, and how it would help her. She did eventually uh, decide that she would go with an epidural. We inserted it early um, and it was helpful for, for all of us. But this, when you are going into a patient's room, really coordinate this with the providers. Certainly um, ask the midwife or the obstetric provider if it's a good time for you to go in. Establish a relationship with the individual, the person, um, and don't try to sell the epidural technique. Just really proffer the advantages that might come from it, especially the early insertion and the route of anesthesia should it prove necessary or required. Emphasize the safety to the mother and the baby here is something that we should all do. And once again, I remind our obstetric colleagues of the value of, of having this early consultation system. Tip number four would be deputizing an early warning system. And what I mean by this is you talk to your obstetricians, your nurses, your unit clerks. I mean, the best calls that I get when I'm covering the labor floor is oftentimes the, the, the person checking in people downstairs. Um, I know Elise very well. She'll just give me a call and say, you know, you might be worried about a patient that's coming up. I'm worried about her. And she's just, um, Elise is just someone that I've developed a relationship with. I buy her coffee on my way um, to, um, back to the labor floor. And um, she has been my best early warning system. Also, obstetricians can be your fans and your favorites. Um, they can give you the heads up on different pathologies that are coming in. Certainly they can send them to the high-risk clinic, but they can also see them on the floor. And this interesting work uh, represented in the table by Bob Geyser, our, our president, um, asks the question of whether or not we can train our obstetric colleagues to look at airways, whether they, this would result in earlier consults. And the frank and sad story is no, all manner of training does not help their airway assessment. It does not result in earlier consultation. Um, you might have a different experience. We certainly have a different experience. But where a change was recorded was the fact that they could request earlier epidurals in patients. And that's exactly what they did in, in Bob's study. And that's something that we've seen symbolized on our labor floor as well, that obstetric colleagues will tell their patients to request an epidural. And especially the type of epidurals where we place a catheter, but we don't necessarily dose it, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But in doing this conversation with our obstetric providers, our ward clerks, our nurses, we establish a relationship with them and that relationship can prove fruitful in terms of looking at the timing and the selection of a, an appropriate patient for appropriate therapy. Um, we also have joint board rounds on our service and this is a multidisciplinary Thing that involves all providers. Um, we meet at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. every single day on our floor. And this really allows us the opportunity to hear about patients and maybe about disease processes 
the extended disease processes that we might not have been able to flesh out in just our preoperative consideration of that patient. Um, it has been demonstrated, and we're just presenting this at SOAP this year, um, different teamwork, knowledge, skills, and attributes. And getting everybody on the same page has been really helpful in terms of managing patients and making sure that we have less crisis activity. When people know what we're expecting, what people know what we're thinking, when people recognize how much time it's going to take to do different things, it all puts us together into a team process that works quite well and serves the patients quite well as well. So how about this early epidural catheter idea? Um, and this is where you're inserting that epidural technique before it's requested or required. Um, we utilize what's called the dural puncture epidural technique. And I'll, I'll show you a pictogram of what that looks like. And many of you probably are familiar with this. Um, it's not a wet tap, okay? <laughs> Even though that is a dural puncture epidural. What it is is all the elements of a combined spinal epidural, but you don't dose the spinal component. But what we do do is we utilize the epidural catheter. We give a small test dose. We just develop a thin band. And that band gives us a lot of confidence that that epidural catheter will be working later on. And just to bring you through that approach of the dural puncture epidural technique, you have your epidural needle in place. You um, drive forward the spinal needle. You take out the spinal needle without dosing it. And then you just insert the epidural catheter. Um, we pause for a moment that if we are not receiving CSF out of our spinal needle, we will manipulate the epidural needle until we receive spinal fluid out of that epidural, or out of that spinal needle. Um, in part because what John Thomas's group did um, at Wake Forest was they demonstrated that if you are trying to do either a dural puncture epidural, and that's what they were doing, because um, John Thomas was one of our fellows, we designed the study together. Um, if you were trying to do a dural puncture epidural, did not get CSF, but you thread the catheter, and utilized it, you had a 22% failure rate of the catheter. You do still sometimes have a failure rate of a catheter even if you get CSF, but it's a much lower rate than 9% is what they indicated in their group. So it's something that we're very sensitive to, but once we thread the catheter, we do dose it, and that dosing, that small conduit that you provided, that communication between the epidural and the dural sac allows some contribution through that and we've been able to demonstrate in our studies, including the Thomas study that we designed with John Thomas, um, many different features that are advantageous. And those features include just creating that small conduit, better bilateral spread, better sacral blockade, uh, faster onset. These are all elements that you want when you're testing a catheter. Moreover, no fetal bradycardia is with this technique, and sometimes you get, with a combined spinal epidural, bradycardia is that you have to react to. So if you look in consensus of all the different techniques that we have available to us, the dural puncture epidural is exquisitely designed um, for any application, but especially if you want to insert an early catheter that you can utilize at a later point in time, because what it does is it tests the catheter from the get-go. You're putting all your medications through the epidural catheter, so you're not relying on that initial spinal component, which might mask a dysfunctional catheter later on, okay? So consider the dural puncture epidural and consider doing this early as well. How about uh, tip number six, and that's confirming a functional epidural catheter. Does initial technique matter? And what has been demonstrated in looking at the evidence is yes, it probably does, and once again, any element that includes a dural puncture probably helps you out. And this is before our own dural puncture epidural studies. So CSE, DPE are helpful in designing a catheter that might be better functioning during the labor analgesia. Also, overall, if you look at catheter failure after a combined spinal epidural versus a traditional epidural, it has a lower incidence of catheter failure. And how about the number of top-ups? Absolutely, this matters. Um, we all have seen in our own labor floors, there's been that patient that needs frequent top-offs, maybe every 45 minutes, maybe every hour. You're using increased concentrations of local anesthetics. Sometimes I think what we need to do is just call the question. 
just say, this catheter is not functioning as well as we want, we just need to replace it, and maybe give you another technique that works better. When we do replacements, we do either dural puncture epidural, um, that's traditional, or we do a combined spinal epidural, just to allow that conduit between the epidural and the spinal space, okay? In addition to this, does the duration of epidural analgesia matter? No. Uh, despite our, our belief that maybe a, a catheter that's been there for a longer period of time might have a higher failure rate, that hasn't been demonstrated to be true, uh, at least when we look at the evidence. Tip number seven is reaffirm that there's going to be no emergent cesarean deliveries. And what's kind of interesting is if you look at fetuses and the fetal heart rate patterns from going from normal to having late variables or normal to having um, deep variables, you have a measure of time. And over that course of time, it's not like things immediately happen and all of a sudden fetal heart tracing looks bad. Generally, it's something that develops over time. And what we've done with our obstetric colleagues is we've said, when you start seeing fetal heart tracings that you don't like, let us know. Because that will allow us to maybe think about different strategies of either one, putting in that epidural catheter, or two, maybe engaging the patient in a conversation of what might happen if the fetal heart rate is persistently low and we need to run back for a cesarean delivery. So we just tell our obstetric colleagues, especially in certain patients, that there is not going to be any emergent cesarean deliveries. Tip number eight is implement the fastest anesthetic combo that you have. And when you consider a general or spinal, we can't deliver that anesthesia until we get to the operating room. If you have an epidural catheter in, in situ, you can start activating that into the labor room. Um, there's a big conversation in the UK of whether or not you can dose the epidural catheter for cesarean delivery in the labor room. Um, the Americans always say, yes, you can, because we've had a great amount of experience with that. And it's something that we would recommend uh, that you do too. We start activating that in the labor room so that by the time you hit the, the operating room, you at least have an agent in place. What agent do you use? We, in crisis situations, use chloroprocaine with bicarb. I, don't, I know that not everybody has this on the labor floor, but in terms of the time savings, it can be measurable. Um, once again, another Bob Geyser study looked at chloroprocaine with bicarb versus lidocaine with bicarb and showed that you can change a T10 analgesic to an anesthetic in three minutes with the chloroprocaine. And Tony Lam did some nice work out of Hong Kong, basically demonstrated that the addition of bicarbonate to 2% lidocaine also sped the onset of this local anesthetic as well, from T10 to C6. Um, and when you use th these combinations, and how much do you use? You use roughly nine cc's of your local anesthetic, mix it with one milliliter of the bicarbonate, it really makes a difference in terms of shifting those molecules across that PKA barrier, putting more in the unfriendly fractionated state uh, so they can really make a difference at the sodium channel. Okay. You can actually incidentally do this with bupivacaine, but the threshold to precipitation is very low. You can only use about one-tenth of a milliliter of bicarb with bupivacaine. In general, we don't recommend it because if it precipitates out of solution in your catheter, you've just mixed concrete in that catheter. You can't use that catheter anymore. So, just with lidocaine and chloroprocaine should you use this mixture of bicarbonate, okay? Um, tip number nine is just affirm that you're going to do an araxial technique. It's kind of interesting. Um, um, we know we can do fast general anesthesia. We recognize that doing spinals does take a measure of time that's longer, and especially if you're doing a regional approach after a failed general anesthesia or after, um, a general anesthesia after a failed neuraxial technique. Um, but what we do with our obstetric colleagues is we tell them that we are firmly committed to the neuraxial technique. We recognize that our residents might not be as fast. Um, generally, it takes some time to place, about four minutes. Um, and when you compare this to what attendings do, and we looked at over 1,200 placements, consecutive placements, um, our attendings can do it uh, within 53 seconds. So within less than a minute, we can have that epidural in place, but you still have to dose that epidural. And that's why we put a lot of attention to having the epidural catheters in situ so that we can activate them and have them ready to go. Because we recognize that even the fastest spinal, the fastest epidural list, cannot achieve the measure of time needed 
five minutes or less sometimes with those really at crisis fetuses. But if you have the epidural catheter in place ahead of time, you can activate it with the different local anesthetics that you have available and have something ready to go. Our commitment is so firm. Um, two weeks ago, for example, uh, we had a patient who had a cord prolapse. The obstetrician was sitting on the bed supporting the cord with her hand between uh, the patient's leg. Um, I was on call. I walked in and I said, okay, uh, she didn't have an epidural in place. And I said, well, we'll, we'll bring her to the back. We'll do a spinal. And the obstetrician was totally okay with that. Um, so the obstetrician rode on the, the stretcher with the patient, got onto the bed with the patient, turned the patient on the side, we did a spinal um, while she was still supporting the, the cord. She had a resident then take the cord, support it, so she could prep the belly and get this case started. Our obstetricians recognize that we have a heavy commitment toward interaxial. Your obstetricians can too. Okay. And with this idea, you have to be very comfortable with the lateral placement. And that latest example was um, a case that we use. And then you need to know how to troubleshoot the neuraxial technique. If you have a patchy labor epidural, what we do in this case is we tell ourselves to just use 10 cc's of our local anesthetic mix, but go no further. Um, in part because 10 cc's will give you a block that's satisfactory to start. Um, but if it's not, then you can still do a spinal anesthetic. If you use more than 10 cc's initially, what you do is you fill up the epidural space, you compress the dural sac, you make it reduced in size by about to 40% of its original size. And it starts out roughly about the size of your index finger, maybe the size of the dural sac, the size of your thumb, and you reduce it down to the size of your pinky. So going after that target, let's say the epidural fails and you're trying to do a spinal afterwards, you've just made it more difficult for yourself. And that's why we just limit it to just the 10 cc's um, of local anesthetic. Serenal NRM2, you have a spinal failure. What do you do in this circumstance? And what we do is that we'll just follow up with another um, repeat spinal. We use a reduced dose. We just use 10 milligrams of mupivacaine. And what we do also is we just sit the patient up slightly. Um, this prevents the movement of mupivacaine to the upper echelons, prevents that higher sensory spread. Bupivacaine can move in the spinal space up to 45 minutes. So it's, it's not like a lock and go. It's something that can continue to move and something that we have to be sensitive to. And finally, in the case you have urgent cesarean, intradrop pain, we ask ourselves, did you place any opioids in the epidural space? Opioids can cut the incidence of pain from about 50% to about 5%. So we generally say that you should use at least fentanyl, 100 mics in the epidural space or you should mix it in with your spinal component. And then if you need to, you can give some other agents. So what we have we talked about today, can we reduce general anesthesia use? Is it an appropriate therapy? Absolutely. We know that patients uh, still to this day die because of a general anesthetic that's gone very poorly. In addition to that, we indicate that, that it is a possibility that even in um, small community practices, but also large tertiary care, high-risk populations, you can reduce the incidence of general anesthesia. Ours is less than 1%. And finally, there are some tips that you can incorporate into your practice to make this a possibility. So thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully this will be your labor and delivery floor and the weather outside. And um, we'll look forward to your questions in the panel session. But thank you very much and thank you for your attention.